Hello, everyone, and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and your host for today's sessions. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment and remind everyone of a few housekeeping uh, details. First, please mute your mics to minimize the background noise during the presentation, allowing everyone to hear the presenters clearly. And secondly, please join the conversation. You do not need to wait till the end of the presentation to ask your questions. Simply insert your questions in the chat area and our presenters will answer them throughout the presentation. So please join in and share your thoughts and questions with our presenters. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Uh, first, Mike Spack. He is the president of SPAC Consulting and is the recognized industry leader of traffic studies. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, past president of the North Central Section of the Institute for, of Transportation Engineers, and a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Since 1996, Mike has led over 1,000 traffic engineering projects. During the past two decades, Mike has founded four companies, including SPAC Consulting, and is the creative force and principal writer of the industry-leading blog, Mike on Traffic. He is an accomplished author with articles published in industry publications and has written several industry manuals that are used by engineers around the world. Also speaking today is Bryant Fiesek. He is the Vice President of SPAC Consulting and he is also widely known in the transportation industry having managed more than 700 traffic engineering projects. Bryant is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and an expert in Synchro, Sim Traffic, Vistro and VSIM traffic modeling software packages. He thrives on developing creative solutions to traffic and transportation issues, so be sure to ask your questions today and uh, see if Brian can't answer them for you. Brian is a regular contributor on Mike on Traffic blog and a published author in industry publications, as well as a co-author of several industry manuals. Please join me in welcoming Mike and Brian. Thanks, Nancy. So, Mike here, Bryant here. Uh, you'll notice we have a new logo in honor of March Madness, uh, the NCAA attorney coming up, and uh, it's also March 14th, which is a very exciting day for all of us engineers, being 3.14. It is pie day. Hope you've already had your pie. We had some yep. apple pie and some chocolate pie before starting this up. <laughs> and uh, Nancy mentioned what we have going on. Uh, a few of our companies, uh, SPAC Consulting, SPAC Academy, hopefully all of you are readers of the Mike on Traffic blog. Uh, and today is a little bit more heavy on SPAC Academy in that we're going to be talking traffic signal warrants and going over some spreadsheet tools we've developed. So this will be a basic one, basic foundational I think we'll call it, one talking about the warrants and uh, getting in them. Uh, you can see our next couple topics towards the end of March there and then into April, so about every two weeks or every two weeks, so keep uh, keep those on your calendar and we hope to see you back definitely. Yeah, and uh, thanks James, we, we did not have cheese for the apple pie today, uh, but we did have some whipped cream. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and dive into it. So starting out, this is out of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD defines a warrant as a threshold condition based upon average or normal conditions that, if found to be satisfied as part of an engineering study, shall result in analysis of other traffic conditions or factors to determine whether a traffic control device or other improvement is justified. Whew! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, so basically these are criteria that we use as part of our studies, but just because we meet these thresholds doesn't mean that a signal or other traffic control stop signs roundabouts has to be put in. Uh, yes. So it's, it's not a substitute for your engineering judgment. That always comes into play. These are guidelines. They should be looked upon as such. Just because you meet them doesn't mean you need to take an action. Just because you don't meet them doesn't mean you shouldn't take an action. So two different views and that's also pointed out in the manual that again warrants are not a substitute for your engineering judgment. Alright, so different types of warrants. There are several different types. Uh, side street stop control, 
those have some basic warrants to look at. They, they don't need to go at every intersection. So there are some warrants to look at there. Yep. Always stop control. Uh, and as, you, as we kind of go up the chain of complexity of traffic control, the, the criteria and requirements get more and more um, for when these devices should be put in. Obviously traffic signals, when those should go in. And by the way, I prefer flashing yellow arrows. <laughs> when we have protected <laughs> permitted phasing. Um, we'll get that in next time. We'll fix yeah. that in editing. Uh, last one, roundabout control. This one we just wanted to point out that I know people are working on different warrants. There's nothing specific and that's because the roundabout can be used as both a, a traffic control device or safety device. It's a geometric tool. There's lots of different uses, lots of different reasons to to go with roundabouts. So that's certainly if you're going to be looking at a roundabout, you're, you're using engineering judgments and you're probably going to want to run both an all-way stop sign control and the signal control uh, warrants as part of the analysis and roundabouts, my hunch is when the MUTCD finally adds in something, we'll end up with something in the middle of the criteria, the thresholds between all-way stop signs and signals. Yep. All right, but that all being said, our focus for today is the traffic control signal warrants. So these are, these are found in Chapter 4 of the MUTCD, so again, straight from the book, and we can move on. You can see there are nine warrants that are listed in the book, and we'll go through them briefly here. So, and again, I just want to, <laughs> a warrant is jargon in the industry. I like to talk of them more as criteria, so I'm going to say that several times that I think it's a great reminder. So your first three, eight hour, four hour, peak hour, those are all volume warrants. They're all based on what traffic is going through an intersection and counting that, putting that together, looking at those thresholds or criteria for that. We should point out that these are the most common ones to look at. Uh, usually when people talk about warrants, they're looking at these three first and foremost. Yep. And to get the data, you can put tube counters on each leg and get the approach volumes coming into the intersection per hour. That's kind of rudimentary data to use. We prefer to collect turning movement volumes and base these warrants on the turning movement volumes and we'll get into different scenarios of looking at left and right turns, not just lumping everything in as through volumes. Other thing to point out on this one, for warrant three, the peak hour, there is a delay function in there that you can look at. So if you run a capacity analysis and you have excessive delay, that can go into the warrant and can help, can help you justify a signal. The, the flip side of that is that warrant three is not used by a lot of agencies, particularly DOTs, and the theory that most of their highways that they're looking at, any number of intersections will meet the peak hour warrant, so they're not going to signalize all of them, so they go to the higher threshold of the four and sometimes even the eight hour. If you don't meet the eight hour, some of the DOTs won't even consider a signal. And that there's some logic behind that, that a traffic signal at two in the morning actually adds delay to people coming up to the intersection when there's really light traffic, so to base a justification just on a single hour during the day, that's how they're justifying it. They want this traffic control to be functioning properly for most of the day. Next one is our warrant for pedestrian volume. So this is just like it sounds, counting the pedestrians, trying to figure out how many are going through there and whether you need that signal to stop traffic and let those peds through. It's a very tough one. The, the criteria is pretty high to get that, so you are not putting that in. You're not putting a signal in based on this one in a, um, any rural location, likely no suburbs. Uh, yeah, you're no. really looking at downtowns and in those areas. Yeah, and not even really looking at a Minneapolis in most conditions, you're looking more right. at a Manhattan um, or maybe a Chicago a central business district uh, to get the pedestrians that 
just based on pedestrians would warrant a signal. School crossing, this would be if you've got a lot of kids going back and forth, it's kind of related to the pedestrian, but uh, it's its own separate one that focuses mainly on uh, school age children. Yeah, and that kind of intuitive, but very few signals are put in based on uh, school, <laughs> the school warrant. Yeah. See, we have a question here. Well, Tony is saying that uh, his state has adopted using only the eight-hour warrant on state routes, uh, and that's, <laughs> it is a loaded question. They are in compliance. Every state can adopt their own MUTCD, uh, and they can set their own policies. So they can say, based, the MUTCD says these are warrants, and you should use engineering judgment. The state DOT is saying, in our engineering judgment, we are throwing away all the other warrants and only using warrant one. Yep. Um, so that's allowable. Um, but then if you're working on a private development, uh, even though that's what they say, uh, we still end up running all of the warrants, um, reviewing them as part of our engineering judgment. Yep. Um, I'm looking at what our opinion is on when to install signals. Warrants 6 and 8 are kind of connected, coordinated signal system that looks, you've got a corridor with multiple signals along it, you want to maintain that progression. Roadway network would look at the, uh, more of the functional classification are these major roads that are intersecting. So again, kind of related, but it's just, it's looking at the system, the overall transportation system rather than just the intersection as an individual. And then crash experience uh, is very well defined. You need to have cr a number of correctable crashes. These are right angle crashes, not rear end crashes. Um, yeah. So it, it's well defined and you need to pull up the crash records for the intersection. A not quite dirty little secret in the industry, but most signalized intersections have a pretty high number of rear end crashes, but they're supposed to have less of the more severe right angle crashes, left turning crashes. Um, so on the balance, signals are supposed to improve, especially in injury crashes and fatal crashes, but the number of crashes may not actually go down with a signal. Yeah, generally signals are not viewed as a safety uh, product, something that you would put in solely on safety, but that's where the keyword correctable comes in. If you do have a lot of those right angle left turns, uh, then it could be put in based on that. Yeah, to and, and safety. certainly roundabouts are a modern tool if you're really looking at crash experience. And then the last one, just intersection near a grade crossing. This is primarily, this was put in in the last round of the MUTCD and was primarily put in to reduce the queues on that leg where the railroad crossing is. They want to make sure that nobody gets stuck on that crossing. So. It's more of a safety measure for the train crossing than it is for the intersection. Okay, uh, and Bryant did not add warrant number 10, <laughs> which uh, is commonly referred to as the political warrant. I still remember a, a signal er, very early in my career, months into my career, that I ended up designing uh, down in Belle Plaine, Minnesota for the Indian Motorcycle Factory was going in uh, down in Belle Plaine, it was a huge political bring jobs to small town Minnesota. They really wanted a traffic signal at the corner, did not meet any warrants, yet the mayor got it in front of the governor and the governor told the uh, MnDOT folks this is going in. Uh, we designed and put in the traffic signal that MnDOT approved and then uh, the Indian motorcycle plant shut down a few years later. Um, so that uh, just uh, that's part of the process. We try not to get tangled up in the politics of these things, but uh, there is the unofficial uh, mm -hmm. things happen. <laughs> that gets back to some of your engineering judgment, though, and also being sure to document everything. I mean, if you are forced down that line, make sure you've got some memos stating that it's not warranted. If you believe it's against your judgment, you can document that and still go ahead with the design as long as your objections have been noted. So, yes. 
important things to keep in mind on on that warrant yep. ten. Once you have that PE license. <laughs> yes. All right. So it's some um, typical data collection that we look at. There's kind of three primary ones that you start with that are related to those first three volume warrants. So the first thing is get your intersection, get those lanes, the geometry, whether existing or future, know what you're looking at. Yep, the speed limits, you'll need that. There's a threshold. The criteria is different with 45 miles an hour and above. And then the volumes itself. So this is just a shot of how we do our turning movements. And like Mike said earlier, we prefer turning movement counts to separate out the laps, throughs, and rights, get the peds in there, get the bikes. Yeah, and we typically will collect 48-hour turning movement counts and take averages, but also look at if one day is higher than the other. So we'll look at multiple snapshots in doing the analysis. So that's the primary ones to look at those volumes. Uh, other information, if you want to go down the line of looking at those other warrants, crash data. Again, you need to get the specifics of the types because we are looking at the correctable ones. So getting a crash diagram like this that shows you have so many right angles, so many left turns, making sure you've got that data. So for some of the system ones, like we pointed out, so if we're looking at this intersection here, you can see that it's the intersection of two higher order roads. The blue and the green would be the arterial collector type functions, so you want to know that. Yeah, if it's in a corridor with a bunch of other traffic signals and it's the next natural so you can get progression down the corridor at good spacing, that's part of the criteria. And then also looking around just to see, are there schools in the area? You can see the lake, the green areas are parks, so you could also you know, try to take a look at that if you're looking for justification. Is this going to be used as a crossing for some purpose? Yeah. And you also need to know if you happen to be working in a small town away from the urban core, there are lower thresholds based on populations. Yes. So it goes along with the speed. And uh, if you're in an isolated area, less than 10,000 10, people. Yeah. Yep. All right. So that's some of the basics. Um, you take all this information. You're going to put it into the warrants. Look at those thresholds. There's some little tips and tricks that you can look at these that uh, we'll go through here. Uh, one of the first ones we like to remind people is that you can use the 85th percentile rather than the posted. So if you want to get out there, take a speed survey, figure out what people are actually going, uh, you can look at that. Like the example we've got here, speed limit might be 35, but if your 85th is above 45 miles an hour, you can use that other, that other criteria. It changes the criteria since it's a high-speed road then. Yeah, and bikes, you can count those as either pedestrians or vehicles. You can put them on either side of the ledger in doing your analysis. So this one, again, going back to that same intersection, two county roads, looking at that, there's no real description as to which one should be the major or the minor. So as you're looking at this, you might try it both ways in your warrants. You could try it with the east-west, your major road, or north-south. So again, there's, as far as I know, there's nothing concrete that tells you which one should be which. Yeah. And here's basic turning movement diagram. Uh, most state DOTs, especially Minnesota and many other jurisdictions, if you have right turn lanes, uh, you will actually remove the right turning movement volume and also then discount the number of lanes. So if you take out uh, those 200 right turn volumes and on that minor approach, you would call it just a single lane approach and just add up the lefts and the throughs. This is another example where let's say we take out those right turns you really don't have much on the side street in this case, but if you look, we've got a significant number of left turns and on the main line and a significant number of conflicting throughs. So there are cases where you can use that. You set your left turns as the minor approach. You set your conflicting throughs as the major, and you can check warrants that way. So if you've got that type of situation, 
it's really ignoring the side street and just looking at those left turns versus the throughs. And here's another similar scenario where uh, you could actually take out the rights and the lefts and just call this uh, on the minor approach uh, just a single through lane with the 350 vehicles. Because um, the criteria have you look at either are they single lane approaches or two or more lane approaches. Um, and the criteria are quite a bit different. Yep. So just, again, some little tricks to keep in mind as you look through this. All right. So now we're going to flip over to this is our tool that we've put together. There are many tools out there for the spreadsheets uh, to look at warrants. And this is what we've got. We've got it in a simple spreadsheet analysis. Uh, we've got the basic instructions, got our notes in from the MUTCD. We do have the always stop warrant in here as well. So if we go through, start looking at some of these inputs, some of the things we've been talking about, uh, which one is your major street? So this one said you can flip that back and forth depending on volume or other criteria, what you're looking at. Speed limit, you want to make sure you get that in there. Uh, it makes a difference. 40, 45 is the main difference on the volume warrants. There's also some other ones, whether it's 35 or less. I think that comes into play on uh, the school crossing, school, yeah. maybe the pedestrian one. Uh, number of approach lanes. Again, you either got one if you're discounting right turns or left turns or two or more. Those are the two groups there. How much of that right turn traffic? Like okay. I said, when we have that lane, we'll discount all of it, but um, you can set that percentage differently. Okay. Diane's wondering, and it's a great question, whether we should be doing warrant analysis on existing conditions or future conditions especially when an intersection is scheduled for widening and improvements. Um, I like to run them in both scenarios, and it's part of the engineering judgment. But typically, it's if that improvement project is imminent, that is the condition you're going to be analyzing. Um, so if they are adding in left turn lanes on the minor approaches, it, my, what I typically do is we'll count that as a two-lane approach. Yeah, I also tend to look at the future, uh, especially in Minnesota, our DOT likes to put a three-lane approach, left through and right, so that's kind of our default case where we yeah. would get rid of the rights to look at it as a two-lane approach. Yeah. Uh, but it is informative also to look at that existing. It doesn't take much to do both, and it can be something if you, if you somehow get in that conflict of, it's, uh, it works with one lane, doesn't work with two. Add to that engineering judgment. Yeah. Uh, going back to our spreadsheet then, again, just that isolated community we talked about, just a yes or no, and then which warrants you want to look at. So yeah, we always look at warrants one and two. Yep. Uh, so then the, the big thing, make sure you get your volumes in. Again, we've just got some plug volumes in here just to look at, but... Uh, this would be a 13-hour count input by the hour. If you only have peak hours on this one, you could delete that. And it doesn't matter if it's 7.30 to 8.30. You just pick a line and put those in. Very easy to do. I uh, got the major and minor. And then here, if you're getting into those other warrants, uh, this is where you would get into all that other detail. So here you would put in your delay information, what's that high street delay from your capacity analysis, looking at all the pedestrian volumes, what you would do, all the questions they've got for that, down to the school crossing. Again, this is just very simple, but it, it's got all the criteria from the MUTCD, and you just basically you're going through and answering the questions as they go. So uh, nothing real complicated, but... Yep, just all the info and answer the questionnaire basically. Yep, and then again, like other different forms, you you get your output. Uh, we've set it up so you get a nice green or red if you've met it or haven't met it. Put most of the information up there too, so you've got a summary of what's going on. You can see you've got the right turn reduction in there. In this case, with the volumes we've got in there, 
warrant one, our condition B was met for nine hours with that criteria that we were looking at. Um, warrant two and three come into our graph down here. So you can see the lines that you're trying, or the threshold you're trying to be above and where our data fell. And then similarly down the line as you move into the other warrants, if you're looking at them, yep. how those all line up. Yep, and the spreadsheet's set up, so we just hit print, turn it into a PDF, and each one of these is a page, uh, including yep. in the always stop uh, warrant here on the right. Um, so it gives all of that. So that was just a quick look at the yeah. spreadsheet we use there. And you and can like see clients, the different like there's, options. There's a bunch of different software programs out there, and they'll all tell you they're great. Um, yep. We assume everybody does the calculations correctly. <laughs> um, we've we've checked many times. We believe our spreadsheet <laughs> does. Um, so with that, we're approaching our time as well. We are uh, look for any other questions that people might have, and... While we're waiting, go ahead and type those in if you have any. While we're waiting, um, I'll also mention at this time, our warrant spreadsheet, the tool we just showed you, we are offering that to people for 50% off for attendees. We've got a code there. It's valid through the end of the month. So if you are looking for a tool, uh, we think this is a very good one. Yeah, we sell the full spreadsheet for $199, and then we, s we sell a pared down with just warrants one through three, which... The, it covers 90% of the analysis, maybe even 99% of the warrants we actually end up doing if we're going to justify a signal. Uh, I don't know that I've ever justified a signal that didn't meet warrant one, two, or three. Um, Pretty rare. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'd love to get this in your hands if you think it'd be a useful tool. All right, so we do have a question about warrant for the PED volumes. And they seem to consider only the major street. What if there are significant hourly volumes crossing a side street? This would be a case where I'd say flip your major and minor. Um, you can look at it so that you are looking looking at that minor leg as a major road, and then that'll do the evaluation for you. I think that's a perfectly valid way to look at it. Yep. And Diane asked about licensing. No. Uh, if you buy it for yourself, your company, your agency, you can use it inside the company or the agency. I guess if you're Stantec, AECOM, something like that, we would love you to kind of buy one for each office or state <laughs> and not right. pass it around to 10,000 people. But no, we're just sending you the spreadsheet and you can unlock it and put in your own logos, take our logos out, put in your own logos. Um, and all that kind of stuff. So it's yours. You own it. You can modify the spreadsheet as you see fit. The way we look at it is anybody could really put this together if they sat down for 30 or 40 hours and put it together. We're just short-circuiting that for you and doing that work, saving yeah. you that time. So what you do with it beyond there, um, not really our concern. Okay. Any other questions in our last minute or two? Okay, so our, our, oh, here's one more. Uh, what was the cost again? Uh, for the lighter version with just warrants one through three, it's $149. Uh, for the full spreadsheet, it's $199. Uh, use that code here this month, and you get 50% off. So uh, I think that's a pretty good deal. 75, about 75 and about 100 bucks for yeah. them, through them through the end of the month. Okay. Any other scenarios for reduction of right turns, asked David. Um, here in Minnesota, there's actually a stepped criteria. If it's a really busy intersection, we only do reductions in step percentages, so you don't take out 100% of them, um, and you leave that some a proportion in as part of the through volumes. Yeah, the, the basic premise is that right turns can, they can go on red, so should you really be justifying a signal on that? So even if you don't have that right turn lane, you could still apply a reduction of 50% or something else to recognize that some of these people are going to be turning on right or right on red, and they shouldn't really be part of your analysis. Yeah, or, or when they pull up to it, the stop sign that's currently there, there's nobody in front of them. They can make a pretty easy maneuver to turn right yep. onto the main line. Um, with that said, you can choose to leave 100% in if uh, some jurisdictions 
I don't know of many, but there used to be jurisdictions that put no right turn on red as the default on all their signals. Um, mm -hmm. Minneapolis used to be in that camp under the theory that it was more pedestrian friendly. Um, so so to, to wrap that question up, I'd say the two things we do are first check with whoever you're working for, that agency, to see if they have guidelines on it. And then second, you got to use your engineering judgment to say how much of this right turn traffic is really impacted uh, with uh, what's going on through the signal. And can they take that right turn on red? We would typically use about 50% if they don't have their own lane and completely eliminate them if they do have their own lane. Okay. Ernest asks, what's the cutoff age on the school warrant? And I don't know that offhand. Ooh, that is a good question. I would assume they would consider any school age, so I would think that'd be through 18. Through 18. At least. Um, <laughs> that might fall into an engineering judgment. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. That's something we can yeah, I'd consider dig that into. I and don't remember. Yeah, we'll see if the MUTCD has anything, and then we can email it out with this. Okay. Um, last, since we're right at 1 o'clock, uh, our next traffic corners in a couple weeks and we did an acceleration lane study for MnDOT looking at uh, inside acceleration lanes meant for basically heavy vehicles turning onto a main line having an inside acceleration lane. Are they good or not? And we collected a tremendous amount of data and we'll be going over that case study in a couple weeks. With that, our official webinar is done. So uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Like Mike said, we hope to see you in a couple of weeks. If you do have questions, we will stay on the line for a few more minutes here, and we'll answer them. But uh, feel free to uh, head off and get back to work if you need. you got to get ready for March Madness. Take that time off there. So, okay. And uh, Randall asks, uh, NCHRP 457 right turn reduction, is that methodology no longer used? Uh, I believe that's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction decision. That, yep, that would be my answer too. Here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, they've developed their own criteria. That's primarily where we work. Okay. Jim asks about signals and stop signs in the spreadsheet. Uh, the spreadsheet does do always stop signs. Always stop. Yes. In, a, in addition to the signal, uh, I guess I don't know anybody who's really running warrants on side street stop. <laughs> no, and I don't know that Condition. there's any specific volume warrants for that one. I think that's just some general guidelines they look at. Okay. Uh, JL says uh, he asked FHWA about school age and FHWA's opinion was it's through high school but not university. So awesome. Thanks for throwing that in there. Yep. Uh, Jessica, safe routes to schools plans sometimes have a cutoff for when funding can be applied, but I believe for school signals in general, it can be any school. Okay. Great. Thank so you. That I, yeah, I think that's, so I think we got some good confirmation there. We're probably yeah. looking through high school as the default uh, if you are looking at a school across the board. Okay. Then further, Janine. Uh, can we test this tool for evaluation before we buy it? Um, typically, we don't do that, but we do have a money-back guarantee. So if it really doesn't do what you think it'll do, um, we'll give you a full refund. But uh, we've kind of flipped through it. It's a basic spreadsheet. Um, not sure <laughs> what there is to evaluate. Yeah. But if you're really unhappy after you buy it, we'll refund your money for you. Okay, not seeing any other comments, so with that we're going to close it down. Hope to see you in a couple weeks. Thanks everyone. Thank you.